Today's title is The Victory. The Victory. And our key verse is verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's say this verse together, okay? But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So happy Easter. Easter marks the beginning of spring. The days are getting warmer and longer. Plants are coming back to life. And it feels like we're coming out of hibernation. But Easter is more than this. Easter is the time to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus, our Lord. His resurrection holds a great promise for us, greater than our wildest dreams. Today we want to learn what the resurrection of Jesus means to us. Paul sums it up at the end of this chapter as the victory. What does the resurrection of Jesus mean to us? The victory. The victory. Let's learn why it's so important to believe this promise of God and what life looks like when we do. May God open our hearts and speak to us through his living words today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is called the resurrection chapter. But actually, it's all about God and his grace. God promised this good news in many places in the scriptures, and God fulfilled it. Not only did Christ die and rise again exactly according to God's plan, but also God caused him to appear to various witnesses to help us believe. When the risen Christ appeared to him, God poured out his grace on Paul a persecutor of his church, and changed him into a most humble, hard-working apostle. This grace of God through the risen Christ is still available to us today. In this world filled with death, God raised Christ from the dead and made him the first fruits of the resurrection and pioneer of a new redemptive history. In the risen Christ, God can make any spiritually dead person alive. Amen. Amazing. God's will is for Christ to reign, making peace with his enemies through the blood of his cross and advancing his kingdom. In the end, God will send him to destroy our last enemy death, hand over the kingdom, and make God all in all. God's grace calls us all to die every day, to truly live for Christ. It's God who created the miracle of life itself, all plants and creatures, all earthly and heavenly glory, it's this God who promises us a glorious body fit for heaven. God will make our current bodies like seeds. And they're going to produce new bodies of unimaginable beauty, life, and power. Though at present we're like the man of dust, Adam, God promises even us that we're going to bear the image of the man of heaven, our most gracious and glorious Lord Jesus Christ. So, in every way, this good news of the resurrection comes from God and his grace. Now, in the last part of the chapter, verses 50 through 58, Paul describes the day when Christ comes again and believers are raised. What's it going to be like? 
Part one, we shall be changed. Do you like that? We shall be changed. Let's turn to our neighbor. Look at our neighbor in the eyeball. We shall be changed. We shall be changed. Let's look at verses 50 through 52. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. We notice several things in these verses. First, Paul calls this future event a mystery. It means no one really knows about it. God alone knows. And in his own great wonder and mystery, God is going to make that day happen. Second, Paul says this future event is going to be signaled by a trumpet. <laughs> it's going to sound a lot better than that. <laughs> I was going to ask someone in the orchestra to do it, but well, I don't know. All right. This, this is called the last trumpet, and it's going to be heard all around the world. This last trumpet will sound suddenly, summoning all God's angels to bring his judgment and gather his elect. This last trumpet is going to mark the end of the chance to repent. And a new era of God's eternal kingdom. What stands out most here is that we shall be changed. It's repeated twice. Here's a question. Why do we all have to be changed? Some of us may want to stay the way we are. I'm pretty good. Why do I have to change? Verse 50 explains that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Flesh and blood refers not only to our bodies, but also to our sinful tendencies. We have to be changed so that we can last forever in God's kingdom and so that we can be completely holy there with no hint of sin anymore. The Bible says only changed people can get into his kingdom. How will our change happen? Verses 51 and 52 say it will be in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. In Greek, it says in an atom. They thought an atom was individual, indivisible. In an atom. In the twinkling of an eye. This is saying all believers are going to be changed instantaneously. Bam! This will happen by God's power. When Paul says we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed, he means not everybody will die physically. Some will still be alive when Christ comes. But whether dead or alive, it says, we shall all be changed. The word changed in Greek is exchanged or transformed in both body and soul. All believers are going to be changed. What will our change be like? In verse 52b, Paul says that the dead will be raised imperishable. This word is repeated in verses 50, 53, and 54. It's first used in verse 42b. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. Imperishable can also be translated as 
incorruptible. So this is not just about physical decay. When we're changed and given a new resurrection body, we're not going to be susceptible to sin anymore. Just the opposite. We'll become like our Lord Jesus Christ, sinless, full of God's life and power, abundant and flourishing forever, imperishable. Look at verse 53. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. Paul repeats this body twice here, suggesting that though we're going to be changed, we're going to keep our personality and individuality. Then in verses 53 and 54, Paul repeats four times these words, put on. Literally, it means to sink into something or to cover something over with something else. It's a metaphor for putting on clothes. In English, when we tell somebody, get changed, we mean put on some new clothes. Man, those clothes, oh, you need to get changed. Those clothes, mm. get changed. Put on some new clothes. 2 Corinthians 5, 2-4 uses the same Greek word, put on, three times. And those verses help us better understand what Paul means here. It reads, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. This is such a great hope. Someday, we're going to get to put on a resurrection body. The best clothes ever. Resurrection body. Fresh and beautiful forever. I think no laundry in heaven either. (laughs) Paul adds here that we will put on immortality, meaning our resurrection bodies will be able to live forever with our eternal God. So, who helps us get changed? to put on our imperishable body, our eternal clothing. Well, it's not mom. Mom's not going to help us get changed. (laughs) Who helps us get changed, put on this body? It's not us. It's God. When Jesus comes again, God himself is going to put our imperishable body on us. And he's going to make us fit to inherit his kingdom. Y'all are not too excited about that, but that's like the best part here. Fit to inherit his kingdom. Amen. And again, this is only by his amazing grace. Part two, the victory. Excited? Turn to your neighbor and say, the victory. Mm, victory. At the resurrection, besides changing us, God also promises us victory. Let's look at verse 54b. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. To some people, death disappearing may sound like a fantasy. But one day, God is going to fulfill this prophecy. Right now, death seems so final. Death seems to swallow up everything and everyone in its path. Death has spread over all creation, throughout all history, all of time. No one, good or bad, 
has been exempt from death. But God promises that one day he is going to swallow up death forever. When God swallows it up, it's truly going to be gone. So, death doesn't win the final victory. God does. Look at verse 55. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? These questions are mocking death. But honestly, death still does have a sting in it. We get stung by death whenever somebody close to us dies. We taste grief, emptiness, and even fear. We might even lose the desire to keep on living. We also get stung by death when our own physical life comes to an end. We try to avoid it, but the sting of death is real. So in what sense has death lost its sting? It happened because our Lord Jesus absorbed the sting of death for us in his own body. The Bible says that when he died and rose again, Jesus crushed the head of Satan. Now it's just the devil's tail flapping around, trying to intimidate us like a scorpion's tail. And the Bible says that in the end, the risen Christ is going to throw the devil into the lake of fire and sulfur to be tormented day and night forever and ever. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye. For now, the devil is still accusing God's children, constantly intimidating us with the fear of death. But our Lord Jesus has promised us, because I live, you also will live. If we hold on to this promise, we find we're no longer afraid of death. Instead, his promise gives us hope, real, living hope. Thus, the sting of death is erased, totally wiped out. Let's say these words together. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Let's try it. Go. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? With God's promise of victory in Jesus, these words are telling us we can even laugh in the face of death. As Christians, we sacrifice. We suffer injustice. We seem like nobodies. We're ridiculed. But God promises us that one day, We're going to be raised as heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. So, victory in Jesus is the greatest reversal, the greatest vindication. It takes us from humiliation, suffering, even violence and death, to the utmost glory just like our Lord Jesus experienced. By faith in him, one day we're going to get to say to the devil, who's got the last laugh now? Paul briefly mentions something more. Let's look at verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. These are other enemies behind the power of death that knock us all down and defeat us. Who are these enemies? They are sin and the law. Simply speaking, it's sin that defeats us. It's sin that causes us to experience the sting of death. 
And it's the law that stirs up the power of sin within us. Under sin and the law, we're crushed and condemned. And there's no way out. Let's read verse 57. Okay, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. No matter how much we've been caught in sin, or condemned by the law, or stung by the power of death, God gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll never win this victory with our own efforts or abilities. God himself won this victory over sin and death through Jesus' death and resurrection. All we need to do is put our faith in him. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 tells us, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Faith in the resurrection of Jesus may seem obscure, but it is so powerful. Faith in his resurrection enables us to overcome the world. It's a faith not just for the end of time, but for right now. It inspires us to fight the good fight of the faith every day. Are you fighting that faith? Fighting that fight of faith every day? The good fight? This faith empowers us to fight to the end and finish our race of faith. In Greek, the word victory is the same as conquer. So what's this victory really all about? Romans chapter 8, verse 37 explains, No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The death and resurrection of Jesus show us how much God loves us. I'm going to say that again. The death and resurrection of Jesus show us how much God loves us. God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Jesus, who died and was raised, is now at the right hand of God, interceding for us holding on to God's great love for us in Jesus, this is what gives us victory. Victory over tribulation, distress, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. Victory over death or life. Angels or rulers, things present, things to come, any powers, any height or depth or anything in all creation. The victory. So what do we do? Let's read our last verse, verse 58. Okay. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Honestly, the world we live in is a dark place. People's hearts are hard, and there is much opposition. But with the victory of faith in Jesus, we can be steadfast, immovable, and always abounding in the work of the Lord. In the Lord, we know that all our labor, all our grief and suffering is not in vain. May God help us believe that through the resurrection of Jesus, he gives us the victory.